Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Drew Nobile, Assistant Professor of Music Theory at the University of Oregon. Nobile's research centers on issues of form and harmony in classic rock music, often employing Schenkerian analytical techniques. Nobile was an Oregon Humanities Center faculty research fellow in fall 2016. The fellowship provided him a term free of teaching to work on his current book project, Form as Harmony in Rock Music. Thanks, Drew, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So the first question is, what led to your interest in the structure of rock music? Why is the structure of interest to you? How did you get there? It's a, it's a good question, and this whole s structure is a very loaded term in music theory and music analysis. Um, and this is something that uh, I'm definitely working on framing at the beginning of the project is what do I mean by the structure of mm -hmm. rock music. Um, as rock analysis has come into uh, the normal uh, analytical discourse, um, there has been resistance to talking about things like chord progressions and large-scale melody um, and all of that. Why? Why? Why have people resisted Because that? Um, I think people don't think that that is how uh, fans tend to listen to music. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure I entirely disagree with that. Uh, there are, um, I think there are a lot of ways to interact with any kind of music. Um, there's been this uh, tradition in kind of high art analysis that the correct way to listen to music is by listening listening structurally listen to the long lines listen to the harmony mm -hmm. things like uh you know i like that melody that's not legit you, uh -huh. you can't say that kind of thing <laughs> and you know with rock there's all this other kind of stuff tied in with identity tied in with place um that uh that people tend to grab onto in terms of uh both uh, audience reception and uh, the way that musicians actually speak about their own music. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to answer your question, which is how did I come to the structure, I found myself, possibly because I was trained both classically and rock, I mean I wasn't trained in rock, but I played rock, mm -hmm. um, that I was trained classically, that my ear tended to really focus on those things that we would call structure. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, a, a, a classic uh, thing for me is that I know the chord progression to to any song that I've heard a couple times. However, I don't know any of the lyrics, mm -hmm. um, and it's just because my ear kind of focuses on that. And when I was in grad school, I started off doing math stuff, but then I um, realized that um, when I was analyzing rock music, um, uh, certain patterns of this structure, kind of chord form structure, were um, becoming apparent, and uh, people hadn't been talking about that, I think, because of the resistance to that kind of analysis. Hmm. Um, so uh, how I, I, I sort of came about it by, by chance, but I think just my background as, as being a, a very active rock musician, as well as having a, a, a deep training in, in classical uh, hearing and, and, and classical structures is, is what kind of led me to that combination. So. This leads me to this question: uh, What is Schenkerian analysis? So that's yeah. a that's a classical musical approach. Yes, yeah. decidedly, and in, uh, so it, it comes from uh, the theories of Heinrich Schenker, who is a German uh, music theorist, uh, pr one of the two most important uh, music theoretical trends in the 20th century. Which, which music theory didn't really exist mm -hmm. as a, as a separate discipline until the, about the 50s, um, and uh, it, the 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 kind of two trends were Schenkerian analysis for tonal music mm -hmm. and um, set theory pioneered by Alan Ford at Yale in uh, post-tonal 20th century uh, music. Um, uh, so Heinrich Schenker, this German theorist, um, essentially his, his theory was that um, all of the music of the composers that he considered to be geniuses, almost all of whom were German, mm -hmm. there was, you know, Chopin was an honorary German <laughs> in his mind, but for, for the most part it was German composers um, who possessed the genius, this is all coming out of this 19th century mm -hmm. uh, German thought, um, uh, their uh, foreground structures, which mean the actual notes that we, t that we heard kind of at a local level, um, all were in service of some sort of larger and more deep level background structure. Um, so when we analyze music, uh, and when, we, when we say that we engage in Schenkerian analysis, what we are talking about is the relationship of the um, note to note 
uh, melodies and, and counterpoints and, and, and chord progressions um, to uh, what is going on at a deeper level. So we've got, um, you know, you've got like 25 chords and then you end with a cadence, for example, and you say, okay, well, these first eight chords are what we call prolonging um, this one chord. So this one chord kind of has a sphere of influ influence over all of these chords. Um, and it all comes from uh, just the centuries of counterpoint. Um, certain uh, progressions uh, involve certain techniques that, that come out of all of these things. Um, and so composers like Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn and Bach and Brahms mm -hmm. and Schubert, etc., um, were all composing in this way. Mm, interesting. So. Uh, what, where I want to get to is, okay, how does that work with rock music? Mm -hmm. But before we get there, I want to ask you, so how do, you, how do you, what are the parameters for you of rock, classic rock music? What's classic rock? What is you? classic rock? I define classic rock, so the um, time period is um, defined specifically as uh, from the Beatles, basically 1963, when they started producing commercial records, um, up to but not including the explosion of grunge in 1991. And, um, you know, it's hard to, to say, well, you know, rock music was the same in that period and totally different before and after that, and that's mm -hmm. obviously not true. Um, but I do set those parameters just because I feel that in 1963, with the British invasion here, well, e even before the British invasion when they were uh, just making records in the UK, um, a lot of different styles um, were kind of coming together uh, in, in the late 50s. Um, you had uh, the kind of American uh, R&B music, mm -hmm. you know, which was mostly black artists, black producers. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had uh, kind of the Tin Pan Alley, the, the, the later Tin Pan Alley stuff. And all of this was kind of starting to coalesce into a kind of like Big Bang-like structure. <laughs> um, and then I think that that, that um, the, the moment that we can define as, as the, the, the moment that kind of brought everything together into one singularity that then exploded um, w was the, the emergence of the Beatles. Um, and then, uh, you know, the ending in 1991 is uh, simply because I perceive a <coughs> rather significant style shift uh, when the grunge musicians uh, came out of Seattle. There were um, previous movements that, that people think are similar to that, like the punk movement in the UK in the late 70s, um, were kind of trying to upset the, the normal order of things, but it wasn't really until grunge came out that they really succeeded in doing that. I mean, mm -hmm. punk kind of had its heyday and then uh, died or didn't, depending on whom you <laughs> ask, but it, you know, it certainly uh, you know, went more into the fringes um, and, and there was no, no grand style shift there. Um, but you know, things that happened in the 90s were uh, uh, a focus on uh, looped chord progressions rather than um, kind of goal-directed forms, and mm -hmm. that one is just the extreme influence of hip-hop, which mm -hmm. is another thing mm -hmm. that happened in the mm -hmm. 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, obviously the Napster uh, online uh, music thing changed the music business mm -hmm. forever, and so um, the, the way that, that music was sold wasn't that one one single that was played on the radio sold an entire album, it was that each individual song had to um, make listeners want to buy that specific song. Mm -hmm. um, and so things uh, became more homogenized um, uh, and, uh, and, and like I said, you know, less of this kind of goal-directed um, mm -hmm. thinking of, of rock as high art. It was much more kind of uh, um, pop. The, the pop influence was felt in all spheres of that. Mm -hmm. So that was the date part of it, but the, but the rock part of it, I, I try to define that as broadly as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes I, I'm like, here's my five Michael Jackson examples. And you say, Michael Jackson is not rock. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, that's fine. You know, and, and th the question is, are we talking about style or are we talking about genre? Mm. And uh, I'm talking about style, which means what, you know, what does the music look like? You know, I'm talking notes, rhythms, chords. Um, and I find that within all of these different genres, you know, the, the, the proto-punk and neo-punk and whatever, like all the, the, everybody's obsessed with the minutia of mm -hmm. genre differentiation, um, the style does not shift so much. Um, what does shift is uh, things like timbre, things like vocal delivery, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people are studying that, and I think that that's great. Um, but for my purposes, um, the rock style 
uh, kind of is broadly applicable to whatever was kind of played on mainstream FM radio in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, so you've got folk rock, you know, you've got um, pop, you've got the the early metal, Black Sabbath and, and, and Led Zeppelin, even you know, and and uh, you know Tom Petty is there and Bon Jovi is there, but then also Michael Jackson is there and Madonna is there. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, as, as, as broad in terms of genre as possible. So uh, try to explain to us about how you're understanding what these stylistic features mm -hmm. are and in what sense do they, does this Shankarian approach help you to figure that out? To define that. Yeah, so uh, you know, one of the the things that we hear all the time about rock music is that it's just the same three chords over mm -hmm. and over again. And so I think a lot of people have taken that to say, um, oh, uh, rock music's chord structures are very uncomplicated and therefore are not the point. Um, all these other things are the point. And I don't want to to disagree with that uh, in, in terms of the other things being very important. And I think that. Uh, you know, to, to not focus on issues of vocal delivery and issues of timbre and, and issues of persona and, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. Um, I don't think that those are unimportant. In fact, I think they're vitally important. Um, but if we stop looking at just, you know, what chords come after what chords um, and, you know, that there the number of different chords being used. I mean, Mozart sometimes uses just two or three chords as well, mm -hmm. but we don't sort of uh, think that he's uh, not using them in, in interesting ways. Uh, and this is where Shankarian analysis comes in. If we can kind of back up a little bit mm -hmm. and say it's not just about what chords uh, follow what other chords, but some sort of large-scale process that is going on um, involving both how the chords are taking us somewhere and how that interacts with the sections, which is the, the form, you know, mm -hmm. so the verse and then the chorus, or the verse and the pre-chorus and the chorus. Mm -hmm. Um, so it involves backing up on the chord by talking about prolongation in this Shankarian way mm -hmm. um, and then uh, looking at how that interacts with, um, uh, with how the song is constructed. So there's another kind of you know, structure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, root and that, that's, that's essentially what I'm talking about is the, the, the ways in which harmonic structure and formal structure interact. So can you... Um Specify that a little bit. Tell us what have, what are some of the things you've found when you've applied this approach. So what, what have you learned about the style of rock that other people haven't noticed because they've been focused on the chord changes? Uh, well, wh one of the things is that um, people talk about verse-chorus form mm -hmm. and uh, as, as if it is just one type of form. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually think it's not one type of form, it's three types of form, and that has to do with um, how the chord progression is laid out, but how the chord progression laid out actually affects a lot of other things, how the lyrics are laid out mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know what, uh, what is kind of going on. Um, so I think I can, I can <laughs> try to give you an example. Um, you've got um, songs that kind of come out of the folk tradition mm -hmm. where um, you have a sort of self-contained chord progression in the verse and then a self-contained chord progression in the chorus. And sometimes those are going to be the same chord progression. And, and the example I often start with is Ramblin' Man by the Allman Brothers. So you got, the chorus goes, Lord, I was born a ramblin' man Been trying to make a living and doing the best I can And then when it's time for leaving I hope you'll understand Here's the end. But I was born a ramblin' man so there we've, we've come to a cadence. The, the harmonic process has concluded. Mm -hmm. And then when we start the verse, we start another harmonic process. Mm -hmm. And it actually is pretty much the same exact chord progression as uh, the chorus. So my father was a gambler down in Georgia. Right? And you, I don't have to play the whole thing, but you get to the <laughs> end um, with a similar cadence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the idea that the, the chorus is sort of one self-contained thing and the verse is another self-contained thing. Um, uh, gives you this this sense. Now, it's not only folk songs that do this, but it's this folkiness to it, mm. where um, you're in the chorus, you're saying, "Come on, let's all sing along." Right? Mm -hmm. This is you know, Puff the Magic Dragon mm -hmm. is the is the classic example. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, everybody sings along in the chorus, and then there's some sort of story that happens in the verses. Mm -hmm. And it's in Puff the Magic Dragon, it's one long story that happens across all of the verses, and in, in Ramblin' Man and others, it's kind of different little vignettes in mm -hmm. each verse. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so, uh, and, and the harmonic structure is really vital to that. I mean, the fact that you kind of end one, one part um, with, a, with a harmonic cadence, with the, with the chord progression ending, and then you start over, mm -hmm. um, is very important to that. Um, uh, and, and another one is, uh, another way, way to do that is to actually have the chord progression continue from the verse into the chorus. Mm -hmm. So the verse just gives you the first idea, and then the chorus um, starts on a, on a non-one chord, which means like not the, not, not the main chord of the key. It starts in a, in a, in a new direction um, and kind of takes you uh, somewhere else, and then you don't get your end until the end of the chorus. Mm -hmm. So the verse and the chorus uh, cohere a little bit. And the, the example that I usually use, um, it, because people always smile when I use it, is Eye of the Tiger. Um, I'm not sure that I can, can <laughs> sing that high um, right now, but I'll, I'll give it a try. So you're in, you're in C minor, you go, right, et cetera, and then you get, um, rising up, back on the street, did my time, took my chances. So I'm, I won't play the whole verse, but you're, you're just kind of hanging out on this C minor chord. Um, those other chords are, what, what I was talking about, prolonging the C minor chord. They're kind of just, just a little swaying away and coming back. They don't really take us in a new direction. But then when you get to the chorus, you start on this four chord. So you get, it's the I of Tiger, it's the thrill of the fight, rising up to the challenge of our rivals. And you know, it keeps on going. And then at the end, this part, I'm definitely not gonna, gonna hit the high <laughs> note, but uh, I'll, I'll do it in falsetto. So, and he's watching us all, it's the eye. It goes way up there to that high C. And then, of the tiger, and there's the end. So that's where you get the conclusion. Whereas mm -hmm. in Ramblin' Man, you know, the chorus was rounded and the verse itself was rounded. Here the verse uh, just hangs out on the beginning. The chorus starts us in a new direction mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then finishes uh, you, you know, at the end. Um, the, the third option uh, involves the addition of the pre-chorus, and this is uh, a, big, a big part of my theory as well, is that the, the, the pre-chorus is not what, what, what some people consider an optional addition mm -hmm. uh, between verse and chorus. You can't just take a verse and chorus and just say, hmm, should I put a pre-chorus in there or not? Actually, what the pre-chorus does um, is it, it points toward not the end of the chorus, but the beginning of the chorus mm. as the moment of arrival. Mm. And uh, what it does is it makes the chorus not sort of have a goal. It, it's not point, you're not trying to get somewhere in the chorus, but you arrive and then I call it the rock out chorus. Mm -hmm. You arrive and you're like, woohoo, like I'm just gonna, uh, you know, rock out like that. So, um, Let's see, what the, what's the best example? I mean, uh, one that I often use is uh, uh, Hip to be Square by uh, mm -hmm. Huey Lewis in the News. Um, it's, you know, it's an 80s. This is not as well known, perhaps, as the other ones that I played. But you've got this, this riff. So that's what's going on in the verse. And you're just prolonging the tonic. With, you're kind of looping around on this, on this whole thing. I used to be a renegade. I used to fool around. Couldn't take punishment, had to settle down. So that's the end of the verse. And then the pre-chorus is going to begin the way that the uh, Eye of the Tiger chorus did with that unstable chord. It, now I'm playing it real strict, and yes, I cut my hair. And then it's going to keep going. You might think I'm crazy, but I don't even care, because I can tell what's going on. And then here, you're going to get that cadence going right into the chorus. It's hip to be square. It's hip to be square. So that's the whole chorus. It's just, mm -hmm. it's hip to be square twice. There's nothing happens in that chorus. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that you've kind of been building up and you've arrived there, um, uh, it, makes, it makes it really seem like the chorus. I mean, obviously, there's the title lyric as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and and you know, you know I, I have these three different types of chorus, and that one I call the telos right. chorus because yeah. telos, yeah, is, is Greek for goal, and it's mm -hmm. the it's the end. So rather than um, actually involving some sort of uh, journey in the chorus, you've arrived and you just kind of throw your hands up and celebrate <laughs> it uh, when you when you get there. So my next question is um, fascinating theoretical approach. You've given us very good examples to demonstrate the legitimacy of your theory. Do you think rock musicians are aware of these structures? <laughs> Probably not. 
Um, aware, and what do, you know, what do you mean by aware? What mm -hmm. do you mean by rock musicians? What do you mean by structures? Um, <laughs> everything, you know, that's, that's what we love to do in mm -hmm. academia, right, is deconstruct every single word. But, um, uh, and do you mean rock musicians who write these songs, yeah. who play the songs? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, are they thinking, I'm going to have a chorus here that's a t telos chorus. That's what I want there. Well, no, because I came up with that word, yeah, so right. probably not. Um, but, uh, so the question is, are, are, are they thinking of this actively? I highly doubt it. Mm -hmm. um, I highly doubt that anybody is thinking of, of, uh, of any of these things in the terms that I'm talking about it. Mm -hmm. The same way that Mozart was not thinking about prolongation in the, in the terms that uh, 150 years later Schenk, Schenker talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we often talk about theory following practice uh, for that reason is that you know, the, a, a lot of this practice was, it came out of an intuitive sense of style. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the most successful songwriters are uh, internalized so much music that it was just second nature to kind of uh, come up with these um, somewhat formula, I don't want to say formulaic in a, in a pejorative sense, mm -hmm. but you know, conventional patterns. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think of the Beatles, I mean, they were playing nine shows a week in Hamburg for years and it was just, they had this incredible list of covers from all kinds of styles. Mm -hmm. And that is why they could c appeal to such a mass audience mm -hmm. because they were incorporating all these different elements. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, are they aware of it consciously? No, I believe that the fact that these patterns are seen just throughout all of these styles in the decades that I'm talking about. Um, and that, you know, that's part of my book is just showing that this is something that happens all over yeah, the no, place. No, 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 no. These are the, these are patterns that are relatively consistent. Obviously, n there are plenty of exceptions, but the exceptions sound like exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that these conventions are all over the place uh, means that there must be some level of awareness um, among these songwriters. And the the next the next question that that comes out of that is, of course, well, do listeners pick up on this? Um, and that's where, you know, a lot of ethnography and even uh, cog cognitive uh, empirical studies um, tend to kind of show that that is not how the average listener listens. Mm -hmm. that, is n that is not the thing that, that we um, tend to focus on when we interact with rock music. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what do we tend to focus on when we interact with rock music? <laughs> well, that, that's a harder question, but um, th things like uh, like very subtle issues of timbre mm. that um, associate with certain cultures. So, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. rock music is so wrapped up with our identity mm -hmm. that you know, when, for, for example, a lot of the indie rock that that is going on even now, but but more like ten years ago when kind of indie was was really in the mainstream. You know, the 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 distorted and hyper compressed voice mm -hmm. sound mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is just is such a style marker mm -hmm. that you could be playing you know a, a Frank Sinatra song but if you put that on the voice people are gonna think of it as an indie mm -hmm. um, as an indie song mm -hmm. um, and you know when people like songs or don't like songs those are the kinds of things that, that, that they tend to pick up on however I this is you know I do not think that that uh, that that means that the structure is not something that we should talk about. Um, and I think that that's a, mm -hmm. a, a problem that, that people have said, well, people don't, don't tend to focus on these things, so therefore we shouldn't talk about it. Um, number one, the fact that it's consistent, um, and you know, I, I, it's hard to use the word fact, but I, I, I think that I do a pretty good job of showing that it is consistent across these things, means that it is, it is something that's there. And I really do think that it is at there at some level of our consciousness as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I heard things this way. You know, this is how I interacted with that music. Um, so it's not that nobody does it as a kind of default. And then, uh, you know, in the, in the next answer, which is, is perhaps one that, that people could disagree with a little more, is that if it's something that's there, if it's something fundamental to the, to the music, even if it is not the default way that we listen to it, I still, th I think that th we should learn how to hear things that way. Mm. I think that, you know, part of, part of this project is not just this is, you know, what you already hear and here is me explaining it, but um, here is a way to attune to this part of rock music that you might not consciously be attuning to at the moment. Mm. Um, and 
I think that will just greatly enhance anybody's uh, experience listening to rock music. You know. So this is a good point for me to uh, ask you about your teaching. So you're also a teacher. Mm -hmm. So tell us some of the things you teach and some of the ways you bring this kind of argument into the classroom. Yeah. Well, uh, my the the thing that I teach every year, uh, which is <laughs> not in, doesn't involve rock music very much, is just the freshman year freshman core theory, which is all music majors have to take. Um, two years of music theory um, and I teach I teach the freshman core and it's it, it is it's classically based I, I bring in I bring in rock examples to class um, it's they're kind of assignments are not are not based on rock examples and a lot of it is to um, to, to teach their ears to focus not on this is good and this is bad mm. but this is a classical style marker and this is a rock style marker um, you know w w people Oh, the, the thing that you, you tend to learn in freshman theory is that parallel fifths <laughs> are bad, right? So if I, <laughs> I'll play a parallel fifth. This is a fifth. It's kind of a consonant, nice sounding interval. And then if you take those two notes and move them both up in parallel by the same amount, you get a parallel fifth. And in all centuries of counterpoint teaching, parallel fifths are not good. <laughs> You're not supposed to hear parallel fifths. However, if you've ever played a um, a rock song, especially a rock song from the 90s, you realize that all it is is parallel fifths. It's right? And so w if we were to teach our students that parallel fifths are bad, um, they're going to say, uh, so all rock music is bad? And then, you know, you are forced to either say, yes, yes. all rock music <laughs> is bad, and, you know, reinforcing this kind of highbrow, lowbrow, mm -hmm. um, problematic hierarchy, or um, you kind of try to tie yourself in knots by saying, well, it's not bad in that sense because it's just overtones and it's just doubling the bass rather than actually being two voices and all those kinds of things. Um, but, but I think that uh, the way that I bring in the, the fact that I understand uh, rock styles and popular styles as well as classical styles is um, through being able to say, well, parallel fifths don't sound bad. Mm -hmm. They aren't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. However, what you as musicians need to know is that the sound of parallel fifths is not something that you're going to expect from Bach. So if you are asked to um, make a, a band arrangement, for example, of a Bach piano piece, or you know, uh, do, do something, or, or, or um, uh, l just you know, listen to music and, and try to identify when it's from, uh, Parallel fifths are not going to be uh, something that you're going to want to listen to in that style, but in rock style would be perfectly fine. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah. We've come to the end of our time. Drew, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us about your scholarship, about your teaching, and to uh, give us some education about rock and roll. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> I've been speaking with Drew Nobile, Assistant Professor of Music Theory at the University of Oregon. Nobile was an Oregon Humanities Center faculty research fellow in fall of 2016. The fellowship provided him a term free of teaching to work on his current book project, Form as Harmony in Rock Music. Thanks so much for watching.